Okay. Let me click the right button this time. So Mary, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Lady Marie. Good. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and talk with us. I'm, I'm, I know that you're very busy, so we'll try to make sure that we finish on time. And for Graham, just to say that if you do want to ask a question, just put your hand up and I'll know that you want to ask a question because if all of us speak at the same time, it gets very garbled and nobody okay. hears anything. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. So, no problem. So one of the first things, Mary, I wanted to ask you, I know you can't, you are only representing the wheelchair services that you work with currently, but I think there are some questions you may be able to answer. We could probably cover all the wheelchair services under the NHS. Now, when it comes to funding for wheelchairs, yeah, are there different types of funding that we can get? So if someone has a long term mobility need, which means that they require a wheelchair, um, then they would. So then they would should be able to receive some funding from an NHS wheelchair service. Some have criteria around whether someone needs the wheelchair full time, as in for their moving around at home as well as outdoors. There are some wheelchair services I know that don't provide um, any equipment if someone only needs it outdoors. So, okay. so, they, can, so they can walk around at home. Um, but if someone is a full time wheelchair user, they've got a long term need, then there would they would should be eligible for some equipment from or some funding from their local wheelchair service. Um, other places that we do often tap in for funding, perhaps for some um, parts on wheelchairs that we might not necessarily fund ourselves, like things like seat risers or powered ele um, elevated leg rests or other other things that perhaps are a little bit beyond the scope of what we normally provide sometimes we tap into funding from the um, clinical commissioning group for that, that person sometimes we're able to do that sometimes we're able to um, get some additional top up from charities um, such as the spinal Wizards association and um, um, or other charities if people have been Perhaps in things like the military, or I mean, for other for clients who've got things like motor neuron disease, we work quite, you know, with that particular charity as well in order to get some kind of top up funding. Um, access to work, so that's um, through the Department of Work and Pensions. Sometimes again, we can work with them to get a bit of extra money if that's needed for something that specifically rate, you know, means that particular wheelchair will work for somebody in their working environment as well as um something that they're using at home so okay. um so those are those are the few kind of like um funding other stream. funding streams that we try to tap into um okay. and sometimes people can also perhaps put a little bit of their own money in when we're ordering a chair if they want to add in something that we wouldn't normally provide so okay. um so that yeah no, so we I'm, try and we work with that so now i've heard uh, people talk about um, we know have the personal health, but also I've heard about the voucher scheme. What is the voucher scheme? So the voucher scheme was introduced, I think, in something like 1990. I'm thinking something like 97, but it might be vague about those dates. It was introduced quite a long time ago in order to try and give people a little bit more choice about what they could get from an NHS wheelchair service. Um, they it used to I mean before the wheelchair services kind of devolved from the Department of Health and Social Security a long time ago, there used to be basically a little brown book that was like almost a bit like an Argos catalogue of wheelchairs. And you could just pick one or your GP could pick one that they thought would be suitable. So whether that was one with small wheels, whether that was one with big wheels, um, whether that was one for a child. And it was, yes, it was a bit like a catalogue and you just picked whichever one out of that choice of about 20. And then 
wheelchair services devolved into kind of work into the community you know, as part of the NHS and they then introduced the voucher scheme because um, the Department of Health became aware that um, what the range of wheelchairs that the wheelchair services could provide um, perhaps mm -hmm. was not to everyone's preference and they wanted to perhaps take that bit of funding that we you know the bit of money we'd normally pay towards a chair and perhaps add a bit of their own in and actually get something they prefer and would that would suit their lifestyle a bit better so that's where the voucher scheme came from okay. and some wheelchair services at that time used it for both powered and manual chairs um we in Roehampton just used it for manual chair wheelchairs we didn't actually offer it for powered at that time and okay. um so that's you know um, that's carried on for you know 20 odd years or so and then um NHS England uh, a couple of years ago decided that perhaps people weren't getting the benefit of the voucher scheme as much as they could do perhaps it wasn't being offered as freely as it should have been or people might not have been made aware that this was an option for them to take that money that we would normally pay towards an NHS wheelchair and put it to something they prefer. So they wanted, they kind of, so they wanted to make sure that the voucher scheme was really expanded to everyone that the wheelchair service came into contact with when they were talking about getting a new wheelchair. So they've kind of transformed it into personal wheelchair budgets partly to sort of fit with a similar terminology to um, kind of personal healthcare budgets, um, which some people have access to, or things like direct payments for, you know, obviously paying for your preferred carers rather than using agencies and stuff. So it's kind of part of the Department of Health trying to personalise, getting people to be able to personalise their care and their equipment um, and their input from social services and from the NHS. Sorry, Lady Mary, you're muted. So, yeah, that happens. So, so if somebody wants to go down the route of a uh, voucher scheme, they can choose whichever wheelchair they would like. Yeah? No? Mm, well, um, there are some provisos. So, um, so yeah, so basically, the, so from our point, so really, the voucher scheme doesn't exist anymore. We don't offer vouchers. We now look and discuss with everybody um, and tell them about how much their personal wheelchair budget is worth and how much they could use towards the chair they prefer. The chair that they would prefer or would like to choose, it still has to meet what we would decide is their clinical need. So you... So for can I ask, okay. Can I ask Mary? So, for example, I need a powered wheelchair. The one that I've opted to go down the route of the getting the funding so I can personalize it to what I need. I've seen a powered chair that I really like, but it's not one that the wheelchair services would normally provide. Would I be able to get the funding from wheelchair services and then top up with my own. Could I do, do it that way? Basically, yes, you would. What we, we would need to be satisfied that it meets the, meets the needs that, you know, between us and yourself that we've decided you need. So like obviously a powered, a powered wheelchair to get around tilt in space because that helps your posture um those sorts of features so we'd want to know that 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 chair you're preferring has that uh we would also want to know that it's you're buying it from a reputable um agency so you're not buying it off ebay or amazon um you're buying it from a company who could help out if there were warranty issues um, or offer you advice for maintenance, um, you know, so that you're not taking NHS money, you know, the money that we would contribute, getting something completely random and outlandish that, you know, in a year's time falls apart, doesn't do the job, doesn't last for you, 
um, and then you're stuck and then you probably would come back to us and say actually this didn't work out because it fell apart can I have some more money and we're like well you know it's supposed to uh, it is supposed to be able to last the kind of average lifespan of a wheelchair which we would for an adult say is about five years so we would expect okay. to not have to contribute to any any other piece of equipment other wheelchair within that five year span um, and what about and what about servicing if we if say we did use the scheme in that way and did get a wheelchair that was approved when it comes to servicing the wheelchair what happened then so the reason that um so the wheelchair every wheelchair service has a particular range of chairs wheelchairs that they will provide directly to a, to somebody um that they don't have to pay for it's kind of essentially on loan long term from the nhs um to that person for as long as it you know suits them and meets their needs and obviously is in good working order um wheelchair services can't provide or maintain every single type of wheelchair, model of wheelchair that is out there, because there are thousands. And if you're going to get your repairer to be able and confident to have the knowledge to repair a chair effectively, you have to stick to a small range that they know and that they can work with and that they can source the parts easily, hopefully. Um, so if you wanted to get something that was completely off the NHS range, that is not a chair that is within what we would normally do then we would call that a third party option and that would be something you would be responsible for the repairs and maintenance and servicing of that chair um, within the personal wheelchair budget we do calculate an amount that allows for repairs in within the wheelchair within the personal wheelchair budget um, but invariably something like um, probably a power chair beyond the NHS range would essentially swallow all that money and you would have to top up a bit more yourself. So Brian, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, no, I, I'm really kind of wanting to kind of get an idea about um, how wheelchair services operate in different parts of the country. Um, I'm speaking to you from North Yorkshire um, and I have had a particular experience over the last 20 or so years and um, I'm familiar with the voucher scheme. I know a little bit about the personal scheme that Mary's just been talking about, um, but I, I've got the impression as time has gone on, whether this is a money thing or not, I'm not sure, that... Um, maybe like everything else in life at the moment that budgets get tighter the options that i'm being offered are not as perhaps generous if that's the right term as they have been in the past and um i mean i suppose i've got lots of kind of issues really and i don't want to kind of go into all of them right now but but it's it's, it's surrounding things like um difficulties in response times from wheelchair services um the time it takes to get assessments the time it takes to get equipment after it's technically been approved those kinds of things i, I probably should stop there i could go on <laughs> yeah i mean i certainly won't um won't say that obviously everything runs seamlessly and it's all a very quick process because you know unfortunately it isn't and um yeah i mean and we and we have had a long waiting list for a time as well so i know that is often um a, a complaint about nhs wheelchair services that there can be quite a long wait for assessment um and and budgets are definitely being squeezed i mean what we found it with I mean, particularly in the last couple of years, um, we found with the impact of COVID and Brexit had a massive impact on pricing. So all the main manufacturers have had, you know, had to put their prices up 
because of um, issues around obviously the global shipping issues and how much more it is costing to ship um, wheelchairs and parts from places like China, India, etc. Um, so yes, yeah, so all the main manufacturers have definitely put the prices up quite significantly, you know, around about five percent or so um, in the last year or so. Um, and also we've really found that just getting parts and chairs has been much slower, but it's not doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason. So there might be one particular part for a front wheel of a particular wheelchair that has taken months to come. And then there's a particular one particular type of wheelchair that's taken months to come. But something else very similar has taken its usual kind of lead time, which um, can be about six to eight weeks. And it's it is it's it's, just, it's very it's been very hard to predict and to plan for when we can obviously hand over equipment to to our clients because we, you know our manuf the manufacturers give us estimated times that things will arrive but they can be way off unfortunately at the moment and that is definite a definite result of you know all the all the kind of global issues that we've encountered in the last two years um as a wheelchair service in Roehampton, we've been um, trying to really work on our waiting list and, and get it down because obviously COVID and lockdown impacted on that and people were having to wait much longer because we weren't able to get out and about. Half of our therapy team were redeployed to help on the wards at St George's um, during the, the first and second waves as well. So we were left kind of with half the clinical team that we would normally have. So those things certainly for us have really impacted on our, on the times that people have been waiting to see us. And it does feel like at the moment, you know, people are perhaps coming out of the woodwork, having put off contacting us. Like I think a lot of people perhaps have done for other healthcare aspects of kind of not wanting to bother people, not wanting to, um, or wanting to be cautious about COVID and not have unnecessary contact. And I think a lot of those people now are getting back in touch and hoping to be seen. So again, having had gone on a, obviously dropped the numbers of people we're seeing significantly over the first and second waves. Now the numbers are, and referral numbers are rising much more quickly to try and, um, as people kind of come back to us and, and want to be seen. So, so certainly those things have impacted, but yeah, there's certainly no denying that I think traditionally Sometimes there have been long waits for wheelchair services in the past, generally anyway. So. Can I ask Mary, it, does it take longer um, for, depending on the type of chair that you need, for example, if it's a manual wheelchair that somebody requires, um, is the wait time for that less than for a power chair user? Not necessarily. It depends on how involved the assessment needs to be really so um for for someone who if they need a replacement chair and it's you know pretty much like for like what they've had before and it's just because their chair is very old and nothing significant needs changing that's probably quicker than someone who um wants to have a new chair but feels they need a lot a lot that is different from their old provision of their old wheelchair um, because then we'd want to do a bit more assessing with them we'd perhaps want to see them they would meet us as a as therapist but then we would probably may well want to see them with one of the kind of uh, manufacturers representatives so that we could really get some uh, some of their detailed input into the best setup for a new wheelchair and obviously then getting that appointment adds a bit more time and then some of the chairs if they need to be built again depending where they're built and where they come from that's been influencing things um one of the man one of the manufacturers closed one of their um, factories in germany because of covid and um and kind of amalgamated it all into one factory but that's called that caused a real headache with getting a particular model of chair in a timely fashion for for a while so okay um if, oh, carry on, Greg. Um, I, I was uh, just going to say, I mean, I don't, I wasn't wishing to come across as overly critical, but uh, just sort of getting my head around 
the issue. I mean, I, I'm kind of conscious that the wheelchair service where I live, it covers a very large geographical area. And I, I guess that's probably the case for other wheelchair services. Well, I don't know about Roehampton. I mean, you may have a small a geographical area, but a higher population density really than where mm. I live. But, um, uh, and certainly it's no criticism of the individual uh, staff that I've come into contact with. I've no criticism of them whatsoever, but I do get the impression that they're rushed off their feet and um, it takes a long time to get an appointment or to get someone to come in. But when they come in, they're fine, you know, they're, they're great. And I think from, from as a service user point of view, just for what it's worth, I mean, it would be nice sometimes to be, and I realise in saying this, it's possibly creating more work, <laughs> but just being kept in the loop as to kind of what's happening, uh, even if it's just the odd email every now and again, mm -hmm. you know, just to say, yeah. we haven't forgotten about you kind of thing. Because yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. I don't want to be kind of ringing up all the time. And, you know, being the the wheel that needs kind of oiling, so to speak, you know, the squeaky wheel. But, mm -hmm. um, and, and having worked in the health service previously, I know kind of the kind of pressures that people are under. So, uh, but it, but it's something about, you know, is, is it a bit of a Cinderella service? You know, uh, is it being forgotten about a bit? Is it sort of, there's so many, there's so much competition, isn't there, from different services, which is quite legitimate, but, you know, is the wheelchair service just a kind of small voice amongst many? Yeah. And, um, becomes a little bit kind of lost really I, don't, I mean I don't know I'm just this is just a kind of bit of a gut feeling I've had um, I don't know whether anyone can ch chip in or say anything about that I don't know whether it's for you Mary or whether it's for someone else <laughs> Um, I would, yeah, I would pretty much agree with you Graham I think we do we certainly do feel we're a bit of a Cinderella service and that um, um, even um, other physiotherapists, other so in our team we have a mixture of occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and some um, rehab engineers. And even amongst other physios and occupational therapists who work in other fields, some of them don't have really any understanding of what actually is involved, what a wheelchair service particularly, how it particularly works, or the kind of um, people that we work with. And, and the range of people that we work with, because most, most NHS wheelchair service will, will see, will operate cradle to grave. So young children all the way through to someone who's over a hundred. Um, and, and I don't think, it, I think it's sometimes very hard to get across the complexities of, of wheelchairs and how one, one manual wheelchair can vary wildly to another one and actually how it is a real specialist area you know to have you really need some specialist knowledge to actually try and get the best equipment for somebody that meets their needs in the best way um, because there's so many different um, permutations and ways you can set up wheelchairs and um, you know I think that is often not really it's not really appreciated and yeah and as a kind of we're not um, in the big acute hospitals, you know, I don't think we're going to have a TV program made about wheelchair services. Um, you know, so we're not glamorous. But never mind. Um, but I, but I, but I think anyone who works in a wheelchair service thinks it's a really valuable place to be. Um, but yeah, we don't we don't get kind of like highlighted for kind of increases in funding. And the thing is, like a lot of the community services or the services generally, is that people are living longer, people with complex disabilities are living longer. And all of that then filters into obviously more need for things like social care, but also more need for things like complex equipment, like wheelchairs and, and some of the equipment that social services and the community teams will provide as well. So that all of that, all of the advances in medical care kind of have this you know, knock on effect on the community services out there as well. So, so considering Mary, that you come on the, an NHS craft doesn't 
it regarding funding doesn't that trickle down as it were uh, do you actually provide wheelchairs for the hospitals as well or is it just for the community so we just provide so our the reason for an nhs wheelchair service to exist is to um provide long-term mobility equipment long-term wheelchairs for people who need them for yeah because they have a permanent need for that if somebody needs a wheelchair because they are um spending a short time in hospital or perhaps when they go to a rehab unit um like um when someone goes for spinal rehab initially or um some new or, or the neuro rehab um centers um the expectation is that those centers would provide wheelchairs for use within that center within for that person's rehab journey when someone is discharged then and they have a permanent need then that becomes the um that becomes our remit in terms of nhs wheelchair services so so we don't provide for use in the hospitals we provide for use in the community okay um, regarding people who are discharged from hospital to care homes, I know there's a difference between a residential care home and a nursing home. Could you please um, provide some information? If somebody is in a care home, nursing care home, and they have a spinal cord injury, for example, they are able to use a power chair to get around. Would they be allocated one in a nursing home or in a residential care home? Uh, now that is um, that is something I think will vary greatly depending on where you are in the country. Um, because I think, I mean, our our general criteria around provision in nursing homes and that's not that's not particularly specific to anyone with spinal cord injury but our general criteria is quite different to some of our neighbors about provision so it it does vary a lot really um i mean our general criteria around a nursing home is that if someone is going to simply be moved around a nursing home we would expect the nursing home to provide a chair for that um we do as a service look at the request for power chairs on a more individual case by case basis um, perhaps on the understanding that certainly i know some of the guys with spinal cord injury sometimes will get discharged to a nursing home as a bit of an interim while they're waiting for more suitable accommodation um, so it's yeah it does but we don't automatically some services if someone's got some complex postural needs but aren't it for a, a manual wheelchair that offers a lot of postural support, but aren't going to be drive, but aren't going to be moving themselves independently. Some services will um, provide wheelchairs for that into nursing homes, and some don't. So it's it's a very it's quite individual depending on the service on the NHS wheelchair service. Really. Because so. we we support in our, our role I mean, as a charity, we more and more people we're seeing being discharged to care homes, mm. and whilst we know it's supposed to be an interim measure, sometimes they're there for 18 months, two years and so on. Mm -hmm. This person, if they had the opportunity to get a power chair, they'd be able to move themselves around. And of course, we're seeing that that's not happening. So this is why I'm asking the question because, I mean, at, at what point is it considered that although it's an interim placement, at what point would they say, for example, if this the only um, space that could or place that could be found for that individual maybe in a nursing home, and mm -hmm. is there a difference with the nursing home and the residential care home in regards to what we chair the provided? Is there a difference? Uh, we don't particularly make a distinction. Okay, as a service. So, but again, other services may do. Yeah, because that's something that I've heard, dependent on whether it's a nursing home or it's a residential care home. That will dictate whether the individual will get a power chair or not. Um, yeah. Do you have any questions, Graham or Anna? 
I don't think so, not in respect to what you've just been speaking about. Okay. Okay, so it was mainly mainly the, the length of time that people have to wait for their chairs. Well, yeah, I'm just kind of getting a general feel. I realise that we're a, a kind of a small forum today, but um, mm -hmm. I, was, I guess I was hoping to get an idea about people's experiences in different parts of the country and picking up on what Mary was kind of alluding to about the differences between different services in different places. So, um, you know, I'm just wondering if I'm an outlier or whether my experiences are fairly typical of other people's experiences, really. Yeah, I suppose on, on social media, you see a lot of uh, questions sometimes. People are asking about wheelchair services provision and they would highlight certain wheelchair services that they're not happy with. So I think what it is that we need, perhaps when we have an assessment, it is, an explanation is given to the individual to more or less give them a realistic expectation of timings. I think because managing sometimes... Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. No, as I was saying, I think managing expectations is always very important. It certainly mm -hmm. would be, well, it would be helpful to me, but I'm sure it'd be helpful to other people as well. Um, I, I think the, the other thing is that um, I, I've only kind of come into contact with wheelchair services about maybe three or four times in the past 20 years. So it's not it's not a service that I'm coming into contact with on a regular basis. So it's, again, a sort of trying to kind of just take the temperature of how things are and whether my experiences are typical and whether I should be making more of a nuisance of myself or just... Uh, you know, just how, how do we kind of how do we kind of make things better so that me as a service user gets a timely um, a timely service when I need it on those rare occasions, thank goodness, when I have needed it, so that the journey from uh, beginning to end is as seamless as it can be. Now that may be just a asking or expecting too much uh, in the context of what we you know, how the discussions kind of gone um uh so you know it, it's really just that sort of um uh just kind of getting a kind of feel you know because I, I mean i've recently been in contact with wheelchairs so i've recently acquired a new wheelchair but the process for that, getting that wheelchair, probably started two years ago. Uh, and for reasons not all of which are clear to me, it's taken that length of time. I mean, partly because I was originally provided with one which was unsuitable for my needs. And so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and then get another one, which these were NHS wheelchairs. Previously, I used the voucher scheme. So I was getting, I'd say, probably better quality wheelchairs, but which I was contributing to financially myself. No objection to doing that. But on this occasion, I was, I was kind of assured that I could get a, a suitable wheelchair by the NHS. Um, so I, I, you know, I gave them the benefit of the doubt and went down that route. But it seemed to take a bit longer going down that route than if I'd said, can I have a voucher or can I have a, a personal allowance or whatever the terminology is now. Um, uh, so, uh, so it's interesting to hear what, what Mary and others have had to say about this, really. It's a bit garbled, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, it, oh. it is, it's, certain, it's certainly possible that I think if you were going yeah, down the, I can see how that would potentially happen in terms of if, you, if you've if you gone from the voucher scheme and you're now trying looking at getting an NHS wheelchair, how that might possibly take a little bit longer just because perhaps we would be have to, having to book in an assessment to look at that type of chair with one of the reps or a supplier um, and fitting in with kind of demands of seeing other people as well at the same time. Whereas I think if often if people go down the, the route of finding a chair for themselves and using the contribution from the NHS, sometimes I think that can be a bit quicker because, you know, you can link in with that supplier perhaps a little bit more easily or find um, perhaps your diary is a bit more flexible than the wheelchair services so you can save a bit of sometimes I think that can save a bit of time um, and and again also you know on the at the other end when the chair arrives that chair then comes in and comes directly to you whereas again for us certainly our NHS chairs they go via our from our supplier to our depot to kind of kind of checked and logged in and then they might come up to us and then we've got to find an appointment with an engineer so sometimes it can yeah, there's some of those logistics, logistical things can actually add a bit of time to the whole process. So I could, yeah, certainly understand how previously it's perhaps been a bit quicker for you, Graham. Yeah. Can I ask also, Mary, um, regarding cushions, pink cushions, because I've, I've seen questions being asked, people are saying, oh, I need to buy a new cushion, and not realising that the wheelchair services can provide it. So I'm not sure if that's something that many people are not aware of. And how long would one expect a cushion to last? Mm, how long is a piece of string? Um, so, uh, so yes, there's a, so the wheelchair services, and certainly again, whether that varies a little bit from service to service, it might do. Um, for our service, in my particular our experience, is that even if someone's decided to, to have an independent voucher or a third party personal wheelchair budget, um, so they've got a chair of their choice that isn't maintained or looked after by the NHS, but we will still provide a pressure cushion for that chair. Um, we'd only provide one because of budgetary reasons. We're not going to provide several, but we, you know, we certainly would provide one. Um, and in terms of how long they last it's, it does vary a lot depending on the cushion so um things like the j2 with the fluid um if someone's you know sitting on it all day maybe i don't i don't know what jay would expect me to say really maybe about two or three years in my experience possibly um something that is entirely foam based um again maybe that sort of time scale it's a bit hard to pinpoint because it, it depends on i think if you are if you tend to be quite warm if you're quite a warm person so or you sweat a lot or if you have issues with continence that doesn't help the cushions last that tends to degrade them a bit quicker um things like the vikers the air-based cushions should last longer because actually really the biggest component is air so there's less to go wrong less to degrade um, things like the stimuli cushions um, if you've got a large enough washing machine you can actually wash them you can wash the whole cushion and that actually kind of almost reinvigorates it so again they should last quite a long time because you know they, again there's not that much to break down or degrade so it really does vary from cushion to cushion and does um in regards to pressure mapping yeah is that something everyone is entitled to who may have a, a, a an nhs wheelchair or cushion um yes again it's making the assumption that every nhs wheelchair surface has a pressure mapping system oh. um so i mean i would i would think a lot of them will do but the kind of pressure mapping systems can cost, I don't know, six, eight grand or something like that. They're not, yeah, they're quite, I think at least, they're quite expensive depending on the system you go for. We've, we've got, an, we're, we're kind of trying to look into getting a new system ourselves, which will probably try and get either some 
funding from the kind of like the hospital charity might help us with or perhaps some of the kind of pot, the pot of capital funding that the trust has for bigger spend it's not something that we'd be thinking would come out of our regular budget because it's it's what's a it's a big cost um um so so again it might be that some of the smaller wheelchair services perhaps have less access to that sort of money and that sort of funding so they might not have one so you know i don't want to say that it's something every wheelchair service would have because i'm not sure it necessarily would be um but it would not be then that it's not that we as service users we are not entitled as it were to pressure mapping it is dependent on whether the wheelchair services can provide it yeah yeah really um and it's pressure mapping is useful and it's quite a good visual guide but it's not the only thing to hang a decision about a cushion on so um because actually it's the really the kind of lived experience of the person using the cushion is the most important thing so even though you've got a lot you know a whole range of cushions that you know the manufacturers say they've tested and they offer good high pressure relief someone will struggle to keep their skin good on one type but actually another one they'll be much more comfortable on or their skin will be much better on and you can't necessarily always see that on the pressure mapping that doesn't always tell you what the what you know the results of the pressure mapping might be very say very similar for those two cushions but someone just doesn't get on as well with one of them and you can't it's, you can't always explain that scientifically sometimes there just seems to be this element of subjectivity about it that you just don't really can't always put your finger on so yeah, I've noticed lately with my question that whenever I'm I'm lowered into it by the, my PAs, there's like air coming out. It never used to do that. Is that oh, okay. telling me that I've looked at the seams to see whether it's split and the foam's coming out, and it's not. But I can hear that really. It never used to do that. Does that mean it needs changing? You think, or it's getting near its end of life? It never used to do it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But from seeing last time we saw you, I think we did decide we'd get you a new cushion because I think you have had it a long time. about three years or so. So it's kind of like it feels like it probably <laughs> or longer. It does feel like it's probably the time to just say, let's not get it to the point that the seams burst and you get that awful fluid out of the J2 that then sticks to everything. So, um, so yes, I okay. think... So I think I think we would we did say that didn't we? So, yeah. so it, has, it has it, it has come in, Lady Mary. I'll, 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 we'll talk about that later. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, yeah. So Graham, how do you get your cushions? You get it from your wheelchair services. I do. Yes, I was interested in that uh, conversation. Uh, I use a J two, um, and uh, with my new wheelchair, um, I got a new a new J2 cushion and um, it wasn't until I got the new cushion that I realized how bad my old one had become. Um, I mean I do I do experience some pressure and uh, but I kind of manage that okay but I've realized that probably the uh, cushion that I was using wasn't exactly helping. Um, and I, it hadn't occurred to me, really, to think that I may have needed a new cushion. Uh, it was a J2 I probably had about five years. Mm. Um, and I think what's, what has happened, well, I've had a couple. One, one did burst, um, going back to Mary's comment about the goo, uh, which wasn't very nice. But, um, uh, but the, the other one, I think the actual base of the cushion had become compressed and it was also bowed mm -hmm. uh, so the one the new one was much firmer had much more i guess pressure relieving capacity and was straighter in the wheelchair so it was immediately more comfortable to sit on it improved my posture part of what the difficulty was 
Um, and part of the reason for getting a new wheelchair was because um, of my postural difficulties. I needed some lateral support because I tended to kind of lean over to one side. Um, so it was a combination of getting a new cushion and a uh, wheelchair that had some thoracic support. Um, but, uh, but, but yes, I mean, I think one of the things that became clear to me was really just to keep a weather eye open on the performance of my cushion more so than I perhaps previously have done, um, if, if only for the integrity of my skin and comfort and maybe neg having neglected really to be as aware as I should have been about how cushions degrade over time. I, I, I perhaps just kind of, um, I was just kind of just went on thinking it would last forever <laughs> in a rather naive kind of way. Yeah. And until, until the, until the uh, jowl comes out, it's all right, you know. Uh, but uh, not the case, Your Honour. <laughs> well, um, if you have no other questions for Mary, I have no other questions for Mary, and Hannah is not saying anything. Anna, if you wanted to ask a question, you could put it in the chat. Sorry, I was just listening. I also oh. have SIA, so I was just intrigued on oh. how it worked. I used to work at Stoke, so I'm interested in wheelchairs and mobility and things. So. Oh, okay. Okay. All thanks, right. But No problem. Well, thanks, Mary. Thanks for all the info, and I hope to see you soon. Yes, yeah, I'll drop you an email. So. Okay. All right. So if there are no other questions, we're going to let Mary go off and do some work now. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's great. That's all right.